concept behind safe passages is this habitat connectivity. Um, and it's the ability of wildlife to move from one habitat to another to access their resources. They need food, they need water, they need to be able to raise their young. Um, they need to be able to disperse. Juveniles need to be able to disperse into new areas as they become adults so that they can raise their own families there. Um, and then seasonally, they can be really important too. As a lot of you guys know, um, we've got elk and deer that migrate to winter ranges every winter. They can't hang out at the high alpine elevations. There's no resources there for them. So they might need to move seasonally, even if they're not making large migrations, um, which makes these connected landscapes really important for us here in Colorado. And they're becoming a little more fragmented as more and more people are moving to Colorado. Anyone that's been around for a while has seen um, the changes in numbers of people visiting and moving to the mountains, um, probably all over Colorado, but we're seeing those big impacts here up in the, uh, in the high country. Um, Colorado's economy receives over $5 billion every year from wildlife viewing, that includes hunting and fishing. Um, and that's a, a huge reason why a lot of us live here. We're attracted to the nature, the beauty, we like to recreate, but we also want the opportunity to view wildlife. Um, that's just part of the values that we hold here. Let's skip over here. So here's the problem. This is probably, I don't know which direction this is, it's heading to the mountains. It's probably a Friday afternoon during ski season. Um, we see this on a pretty regular basis. We're starting to see it more and more now, even in Summit County, just heading to the grocery store or trying to get the Frisco from Silverthorne on the weekends. It's just getting harder and harder to really, for us to move about the county. And if you think about, uh, if you are wildlife, if you are elk or deer or a mountain lion or an, an animal just trying to do its thing, and live in the habitat that it needs to live in, and you're experiencing this, if we can't move, how the heck are they doing it? So um, this is really the issue here. We've got more and more housing developments and you know, it's, it's no one's, no user group in particular's fault. It's just that this is a really attractive place to live. And um, it's about finding that balance. How can we live here and also make sure that the values that we, that we share together are remain intact, such as wildlife viewing. So this is these are older statistics. I'd be interested to see what they look like today. Um, on average, there's about 3,600 or so reported wildlife-related accidents. Um, you can add almost double that for the ones that go unreported, um, or if they're smaller animals, like if you hit a fox or something like that, and it doesn't really cause um, property damage, those typically don't go reported. So upwards of 6,000 or so uh, wildlife related vehicle accidents each year. Um, a few of those end up being involving fatalities, well, over three, and then over nearly 300 accidents where people are actually injured in those. Um, and again, a lot more with small mammals that often go unreported. So Colorado Parks and Wildlife estimates that up to 2% of some wildlife populations are killed annually on Colorado's roads. And there in each year in Colorado, there's a, as many mule deer killed in wildlife vehicle collisions as are hunted. So same numbers. Um, that, those are pretty, pretty big numbers. This number, every time we go to research it, it increases every single time. And we are constantly updating our statistics on the website for this. But right now, and with this, these are the numbers that came from Jared Polis last year, is that we are spending $80 million every single year um, on costs related to wildlife vehicle collisions. You're talking about insurance, medical bills, car repairs, emergency vehicle services, property damage, all of those things that go along with it. It's literally like $80,000 being set on fire every single, or excuse me, $80 million being set on fire every single year. It's a big waste. However, it's not all doom and gloom. There are answers to these problems out there. It's very doable and it just takes a little bit of education um, and really reprioritizing what we're doing out there and how we're spending our money. Um, wildlife crossing structures, including overpasses and underpasses, are proven to be the most effective solution to creating safer roads for both people and for wildlife. Reconnecting the landscape with wildlife crossings does not only keep wildlife populations healthy, 
which has those associated ecological, um, social, and economic benefits, but it makes our roads much safer for us traveling out there and our visitors as well. Um, across North America, wildlife crossing structures and wildlife fencing, this is usually associated with the under and overpasses, have been shown to reduce uh, wildlife vehicle collisions by nearly 95%. That's huge. So what's stopping us? We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, this is an example of the wildlife overpass that I'm sure many of you have driven underneath on the way to Kremlin. Um, what you might not realize is that there's two overpasses, but there's also five underpasses and several much smaller culverts for animals to pass underneath in just an 11 mile span. So we know it's doable. This is another example. If anyone's been to Banff National Park in Canada, this is uh, one of those wonderful examples of their overpasses there have been highly successful. This is another one um, on Highway 9. So these are these are the ones that you don't see because you're driving over them as you're traveling, but uh, mule deer safely traveling underneath Highway 9. So to highlight a little bit more about State Highway 9, I know a lot of folks are really familiar with those wildlife crossing structures there and the successes that they've seen so far. You don't have to white knuckle it anymore when you're driving that section of Highway 9, especially at night and in the winter time. So that's that's a winter range for elk and deer. Um, they'll come from all over Summit County and winter down there in the middle, um, middle of the valley. And they'll we talked about the seasonal migration. So they will actually like move across the highway to access resources on a daily basis. And that stretch of highway used to be an absolute slaughterhouse until those wildlife crossing structures were built. So it's an 11 mile section, again, two overpasses, five underpasses and several small structures uh, were completed. And you can see uh, the numbers before. So there were two phases of construction. You can look at the wildlife vehicle collision carcasses that were counted before phase one and they dramatically decreased. And after phase two of the construction, they went down to an average of, I think it's either four or six um, hits per year, down from 57 hits per year. So that's huge. So we're talking about a 90% reduction of wildlife vehicle collisions. So those roads, wildlife can now cross, people can not white knuckle it when they're driving that direction, and it's a heck of a lot safer for all of us. This is pretty interesting though. So um, and, and their five-year study on these structures is about to be published. So look for that if you're interested in, in statistics and nerding out on wildlife stuff like I am. Uh, but mule deer used the crossings on State Highway 9 over 83,000 times in the first four years. It doesn't mean those were 83,000 individuals, but that's how much they were moving back and forth and back and forth with absolutely no worries about getting hit and drivers didn't have to be worried either. Those are pretty staggering numbers. So uh, one of our researchers, Paige Singer, they were up here checking cameras on one of the overpasses. I believe this was last winter and the mule deer have become so habituated to crossing this that she was on the overpass checking cameras and this, uh, these mule deer crossed right in front of her. So I wanna play this, hopefully this video works for you. If you listen closely, you can hear the cars going underneath. Pretty cool. Okay, so before we um, dive into the next kind of topic here, are there any other questions? Any questions on Highway 9? Uh, anything you've heard so far before I keep moving forward? No questions in the chats. Okay, sounds good. Um, we're not the only ones doing this. This is becoming uh, 
the norm these days, I'll say. So in 2017, we had our first wildlife transportation summit where lots of different agencies and landowners and organizations joined to say, what can we do about this? Yep, go ahead, Cam. Yeah, um, we had one question come up on Facebook. Yeah. Uh, after I said that, it says, obviously working on Highway 9, but it appears collisions were on their way down before structures built, before structures were built. Any thoughts on this? Let's go back and look at that slide. You know, it's statistics, so you can kind of interpret them however you want. Um, what may have been this point here, we're talking the average is this dotted line across the middle. Um, in milder winters, you might not have as many uh, as many hits if they've got more, more room to roam and more space to be. If they can be a little bit higher up in elevation, however, if they're crammed down into the middle of the valley near the road and they're crossing to get those resources, um, you're probably looking at a, a bigger winter where they didn't have as much space to expand. And I'm not sure which winters represented, you know, what the seasons were for each of these points here, but usually you can account for some type of um, just whatever the weather was doing that winter as far as behavior and how many hits you were getting. Does that help answer? I think so. Cool. And we had a uh, we had one more question as well on Facebook sure. come up. Um, just wondering where where someone can get that information. Um, that is a good question. The probably Parks and Wildlife has that. I have that question and or those um, documents that I'm happy to send out. The five-year study will be published really soon, like any day now. Um, so let me let me get the information for that on where that's going to be published publicly, so that everybody can take a look at that, and I can uh, I can find out. So hopefully folks that have signed up here have, you've got their emails, Cam, and we can get back to people on this. Yep, um, this was a Facebook commenter, but I'll, I'll get his email from him and- Okay, exchange. awesome. Yeah, I'd be happy to follow up with that. Cool. Um, again, so Wildlife Transportation Summit held in 2017. From that, an alliance was formed. The two main organizations uh, kind of spearheading that were Colorado Parks and Wildlife and the Department of Transportation, recognizing that there's kind of an inherent conflict there with road transportation projects and wildlife. Um, you can have fencing, which works really well for preventing wildlife vehicle collisions. And you'll see that from Vail all the way to beyond Glenwood Springs, you've got just fencing. However, you don't have any way for animals to cross. So you're keeping them from accessing the resources and range that they need. So it's finding that balance to be able to do those road transportation projects, as well as keeping those highways somewhat permeable for, for wildlife and making it safer for everybody. Um, in 2019, Governor Polis did sign an executive order um, that directed state wildlife and transportation agencies to identify policy and regulatory opportunities to promote the conservation of seasonal big game habitat and migration corridors. So um, it's been a little slow to get going, but we've got a lot of good folks in office now that are really supportive of this. And um, we're making some in inroads with, with that as well. In addition to the state level organizations that have been formed, you've got folks like us, Summit County Safe Passages that were kind of along the same path, but doing it a little differently and on our own. So um, we're kind of a grassroots initiative. Um, the, the idea behind Summit County Safe Passages, it was, uh, it was kind of born out of the, the Highway 9 realignment project in Frisco, where Leslie's curve was taken out and we were working with CDOT trying to figure out the best way to offset impacts to wildlife there. And instead of doing on-site mitigation, we decided that the best use of mitigation funds would be to complete this uh, countywide connectivity study to really identify where these hotspots are, where our problem areas are, and how we can best move animals across the highway. For those that are joining that aren't from Summit County, just to give you a layout, um, I, I don't know if there are many folks on, on board that aren't familiar with this, but uh, this is just a general area. You can see the green, that's all national forest. So um, a really great opportunity to do some cool things with public lands here in our community. 
So Summit County Safe Passages, uh, we created this plan, again, that was um, from mitigation funds that were contributed from CDOT. And we wanted to create this common vision of landscape connectivity across jurisdictional boundaries because wildlife don't know boundaries. Um, we wanted to make sure that we know funds are really limited and we wanted to make sure we were getting the most bang for our buck and actually doing things that were gonna move the needle for wildlife. Um, you can plant trees right next to a busy highway and create habitat, or you can take that offsite and do something much bigger at a landscape level. And that's where we decided to focus our efforts. Uh, we really wanted to bring together this really diverse group of stakeholders that we have um, and, and create this common vision. We all have different agendas. We all have different ideas of how, how things should be moving forward and how we should be addressing this issue in the county. But what was really cool about this project is it, it was all of us putting our opinions on the table and our thoughts and recommendations to develop these plans. So what came out of it, the Summit County Safe Passages Plan is a collaborative document. Um, it was funded through uh, US Forest Service and CDOT funds. However, all of the meetings, every step that we went through to create this uh, came, had input from all of our different stakeholders and organizations. So um, we really created a lot of buy-in on this, that it's a document that people can really refer back to and feel good about. It's not a direction um, that they're being given. So that big stakeholder process, we had 17 priority initiatives that came out of it. To me, it kind of looks like almost every section of uh, highways in Summit County has been identified as, a, as an issue. Recognizing we don't have the money or the manpower to really make this happen in every section, we narrowed it down to just a few priority initiatives that we're gonna work on. Um, the criteria that we used to identify these uh, priority areas was based on wildlife safety and feasibility. Um, so for wildlife, we're talking about, you know, how, how important is this connection to the health of the species population? Um, are the species that use this area threatened or endangered? Are they federally protected? How big of an issue is this for safety? What's the level of risk of a wildlife vehicle collision for drivers? So is it a, is it a major hotspot? And then our second tier really talked about urgency and opportunity. How threatened is the connection? Are there protected lands nearby that we can really um, utilize that opportunity? How feasible is it to actually construct a wildlife crossing in this area? And are there any really unique opportunities that will facilitate funding and construction? So that was definitely a third, third piece that added into it when we started deciding which of these 17 initiatives we were gonna take forward. We have an amazing partnership with loads of different people. And this, this slide shows actually about a year old, so we could even expand beyond this. We've got about two pages worth of partners that we're really excited to have, and they're all active. And it's been, I think that's one of the biggest wins that has come out of this process so far is the um, strengthening and building the partnerships that we maybe didn't have in the past or that we had, and we've really come together on this one. So um, it's a big win for everybody. So of the 17 priority linkages, these are the three that kind of came to the top as the most important to work towards right now. And we're looking at the lower blue river. So north of Silverthorne, between Silverthorne and Green Mountain, um, not specifically this section that's highlighted there. There's another section actually a little further north near Green Mountain Reservoir that ties into the current Grand County and Highway 9 um, crossing structures that we are also looking at very closely because we have a group of folks that works together to move this area forward. Um, Breckenridge uh, near uh, Blue River, south of Breck in the Blue River area, where we've got high traffic volumes, lots of homeowners out in that direction. Um, our biggest really impact out here, we have a lot of moose collisions. And uh, that obviously that's a really dangerous animal to be running into in your vehicle. So um, this one's a little trickier. There's a lot more folks involved, uh, private landowners, um, a couple of different towns. So we are doing our best to just kind of make sure that they've got the information needed for capital improvement projects. And when there are opportunities for us to say, hey, let's, let's look at this plan, the Safe Passages plan, and see what recommendations we can implement from there as you're considering more projects down the line. 
So those are two. And then the third one that has the most momentum behind it right now, and really it's because it's that opportunity um, is the biggest piece of it that has brought this to the top is the east side of Vail Pass. So between Copper Mountain and the top of Vail Pass or the summit of Vail Pass, um, we're talking about the westbound lanes because it's a divided highway in that area. Um, it's a really unique area for a lot of reasons. And I'm gonna dive into that by switching over to a story map here in just a moment. So a few of the things that we've accomplished so far in our short tenure as of being a nonprofit, uh, we did get nonprofit status in 2018 after developing this plan. Um, we have a beautiful website. I encourage anyone to go check it out. There's, if nothing else, there's just some really cool pictures. Uh, we've worked with Summit County government and had them in, uh, formally endorse our plan um, so that they're a huge partner in what we're doing here. We have, I think we've conducted over 20 or so community events. We're at all kinds of booths. And then the most recent thing that we've accomplished is finalizing the feasibility and design study for the I-70 Eastville Pass Crossings. Um, a few examples of the community outreach we've done. We've done um, film screenings a couple of times. We've done field visits. We are at every booth that we can possibly be invited to for community events. You'll see us there uh, just educating the public and talking to folks and making them more aware of what we're doing. These are, these are uh, examples of our field visits from our ski area representatives. We had city and county officials there, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, CDOT, and then our general public was invited out as well to come tour the area of uh, Vail Pass where proposed crossing structures are. 2020 was a big year for us. Even though we didn't get to do a lot of community events, we still had some pretty big gains. We received the 2020 um, Colorado Parks and Wildlife Partners in the Outdoors Partner of the Year for the Northwest region of Colorado, which is super exciting. So um, that was really fun to be the recipient of that. And then um, pardon me for the next slide. I'm not really excited to share it, but this PowerPoint was put together before I did this. So um, the other award we got was the uh, 2020 Partnership Award with Public Lands Alliance. So I was nominated um, by some coworkers and colleagues for um, kind of spearheading this effort and so a couple of awards under our belts, which is really exciting. And it puts us in a great position for more funding and to raise more awareness. We've really come a long way in the couple of years we've been a nonprofit. Okay, cool. Any questions, Cam? I'm gonna transition over to the story map. There's no questions on... Uh on the Zoom, we'll give it a sec for Facebook. Why don't you start the transition and if something comes up, because they're a little loud. Sounds good. Okay. So we are gonna dive into more detail about the I-70 Eastvale Pass wildlife crossing structures and this feasibility study that we have recently completed for this section of interstate. Oh, I know what I have to do. I have to stop sharing and then reshare. Yeah, we did have a question from Facebook okay. a bit ago just about the cost of these structures, underpasses or overpasses, and I, I'm assuming that you're going to go into that in more detail when you dive into this specific one. Yeah, for and they, they all really differ. To be totally honest, um, there are, so for like the Highway 9 crossing structures, that was, those were constructed and designed as part of a much larger um, highway transportation projects. So when they're combined with projects that CDOT is already on board with doing, that's going to, you know, widen shoulders or create turn lanes, things like that, then the cost is significantly lower. Um, a lot of it depends on the terrain that you're working with. Mm. Pretty easy terrain to work with out there. Lots of natural gullies and dips where you could naturally put uh, um, underpasses or road cuts where you could plop down a structure for an overpass. So and it's all relative depending on uh, what you think is expensive is or not. But I believe that the wildlife crossing structure and fencing piece of that project was about $10 million. So it was about 20% of the, the total project cost. I-70 across an interstate is an entirely different story. Um, part of what makes this a little bit more challenging and different is that this is a standalone project and it is not associated 
with the CDOT transportation or road project at all. They don't have any plans to do anything with this section of the interstate for quite some time. Um, but it's still a really important piece to mitigate. So um, we're gonna get to the cost towards the end of this, but significantly more expensive here, but there's a lot of reasons why. Okay, can you guys see, this is the I-70 Eastville Pass Wildlife Crossings that you're looking at, is that correct? It's still, it says uh, that Ashley Nessa started screen sharing, but it doesn't pop up a screen. Try like getting out of that and going back in maybe. Here's what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna close this guy out and then I'm going to reshare. How are we looking? It's still not popping up. It's still like just saying she, you've started screen sharing. I'm not sure what the deal is. And nothing there, huh? Let's try it a different way. Bear with us, everyone. And uh, the person who asked about the cost and commented, worth it, thanks. Absolutely. We're gonna try and access this from our website instead. Okay. How about that? Working? Cool. All right, so this is this amazing story map that uh, my colleague Paige Singer has built for our website and to share the story and the details of the crossing structures on I-70. Um, there are some animations in here. I recognize with Zoom, things can be a little bit glitchy. I encourage anyone that's watching and wants more information to head to our website and check this out on your own. It'll stream a little better when it's not being presented, um, but we're gonna go through this. Okay, so again, the why for Vail Pass, this is a really unique area. It's, it's high elevation. We've got deer and elk herds in this area that haven't been connected for decades since I-70 was created and since the traffic has um, increased so much. Um, it's a really important summer range for a lot of these animals to travel back and forth. So uh, really unique in that regard. Public land on either side. So you've got wilderness, eagles, eagles nest wilderness to the north side of the interstate here, to the south side of the interstate, you've got more national forest. Um, and we've got what we consider a forested landscape linkage. We manage it as a landscape linkage for carnivores and other animals in our forest plan for the White River National Forest. So because we're not dealing with a lot of different um, property owners here, it, it makes it a bigger opportunity for us to be able to do something. We've got links in this area. Um, some people love that, some people hate that, but the fact of the matter is they're there and they are a federally threatened species, so they are protected. Um, and they're there and that's super cool. And it's one of the very few known breeding populations on this, like in the northern part of the state. So we wanna do everything we can to protect that. Got a lot of elk in this area too. And I know that if there's anybody online that, that hunts, um, you've seen that and it's a really popular place for hunting. So, you know, maintaining those connections is really important to maintaining the populations for hunters as well. Lots of mule deer. So like I said, we've pretty much got every species of wildlife that you might would anticipate finding in the Rocky Mountains are right here on Vail Pass. So this is a little bit more about the plan that you can read, but um, some drone footage of our traffic. 
here's what's unique about this area. You've got a divided highway. So when you talk about building a wildlife crossing structures over or under an interstate, you think, oh my God, how do you get across four, five, six lanes of highway? Um, I don't know the answer, but apparently they're doing a really good job of it in LA for the uh, Save the LA, Save the Cougars campaign in LA. So we're taking good notes from Beth, Beth Pratt over in that area. Um, what's neat about this area, it's divided. So you're really only working with one or the other eastbound or westbound lanes. Our eastbound lanes are really cool. They've got span bridges that are already built into them because we have creeks and all kinds of riparian areas that come underneath. So animals, that portion of Vail Pass is already pretty permeable for wildlife. They can move underneath these span bridges. You can see there's a span bridge right here on this slide that you're looking at. Um, so when we're talking about building wildlife crossing structures, we're looking at just the westbound lanes. Two lanes of traffic is a lot easier to deal with than four or five or six. This is a huge travel corridor, not only for wildlife moving across the interstate, but for our recreationists, for us, if we want to go anywhere in the springtime, spring's coming up. I wonder how many people are going to Moab even this weekend. We're getting to that time of year where we have folks coming from the Front Range all the way across to the West Slope. And this is a major um, artery for travel. Over 23,000 vehicles a day on average. Um, peak weekends, you're seeing a lot more than that. So this is a 60 second video that Paige took when she was on Vail Pass to give you an idea of a mule deer. So a mule deer research says that a mule deer needs at least a 60 second break in traffic before it can feel safe crossing a road. And this is fall, so this is not peak season, and this is the middle of the day, so not a peak traffic flow time, and you're never getting that 60 seconds for an animal to be able to safely cross. So just an idea of the amount of traffic that we're seeing here. So we don't have as high of wildlife vehicle collision numbers in this area, and that is due simply to the fact that animals cannot cross, and they've chosen not to any longer. So it's basically become pretty much a barrier for most wildlife movement in this area. We do still have plenty of collisions, moose, mountain lions, bear, um, and hopefully we can mitigate that here soon. So again, we're use, utilizing the existing span bridges that are there um, as part of that movement corridor so they can get through the, the existing span bridges and then be able to use one of our crossing structures on the westbound lanes to then get to the other side of the road that they haven't seen in ages. They probably never, most of these animals. And I'm not gonna go through all of this in detail, but these are the current span bridges that we have along I-70 between Copper Mountain and the top of Vail Pass, and an idea of where those exist. This map is really fun when you go to play with it on your own, you can zoom in and get really close and personal with some of these areas and really learn a lot about this. It's super interactive. Yeah, I, I checked it out earlier, everyone. And I really highly recommend everyone going to summitcountysafepassages.org and giving this a scroll through. It is a pretty awesome feature that they just put yeah. up on their website. We're pretty proud of it. So the feasibility study, we're not gonna dive into that right now. If you really love to detail, read details and understand numbers, um, that's not for me. I like the bigger picture stuff, like bring it to me in a visual like this. But if you want the details and all of the engineering and all of the potential flaws and uh, what could work in these areas, read that feasibility study. I was done by Wood Engineering and we received funding from Vail Resorts, from Arapaho Basin and from the Center for Large Landscapes to complete this feasibility study, which is the first phase of design needed. Okay, so what we're looking at here but we just go ahead real quick we got a couple questions on yep, facebook got it. i want to get to um so someone asked it seems everyone wins the locals the tourists and the wildlife with the construction of the structures of this nature um i imagine the support has been phenomenal have you run into any adversaries i wouldn't say adversaries um but i will say that you know people have different ideas of where funds should go to um and in my opinion, this is me like taking off my Forest Service and Safe Passages hat and just my personal hat here. This belongs to us. This is on, on public land. And if this is something we want to see happen, 
think we get a lot of comments that, okay, well, when is CDOT gonna pay for this? When is the government gonna fund this? Well, I'm not sure if everyone's aware, but there's not a lot of money to be had by those entities. So these are the types of things that we need to make happen as a community. Um, if we want safer roads, if we want to value our wildlife and continue to see them thrive, then it's our responsibility to take part in trying to find funds to make these things happen. It is a win-win, but, um, but again, funding is always an issue for these types of large capital uh, projects. And we can get into a little bit more of the cost, but again, um, we're always looking for help and ideas, you know, big grants, things like that. Um, that's kind of the direction we're going for funds, but that, that's really the biggest obstacle. I wouldn't say that we've had any adversaries uh, to this, but certainly folks that have questioned, well, this is never gonna happen because we don't have enough money. It's just a matter of how creative you want to get. Cool, thanks. Yep. Um, Any other questions? Yeah, we had one more from Facebook. Yeah. Um, this person's wondering if uh, traffic levels are higher on I-70 during the winter ski season or in the summer. Which is a pretty good question. I would, have to, I would have, yeah, it's a really good question. I'd have to jump on to CDOT's website. They have all that information there. Um, on what their traffic volumes are. And you can break it down by month. As you can imagine, our ski season months are much higher than our off season months, but our off season months are starting to gradually creep up because we don't have much of an off season anymore. Um, summer months, you guys know, summer's really busy here from the 4th of July through Labor Day. You see those numbers going up, but then you talk about you know, the off season, you've got your front range folks that are heading to Moab and heading west for road trips. So. I don't know if there's a huge discrepancy among um, winter and summer season anymore. You certainly are seeing um, traffic volumes that are a little bit less in the off season, but again, I th the numbers overall and every month are creeping up. Um, it was really interesting though last year with COVID that traffic volumes were lower than they'd been in a long time. So that was, it was kind of nice to, to see that. And we wondered how the wildlife might be responding to um, a, little, a little breather you know, I enjoyed it, that was for sure. Cool, I'm gonna keep moving, you good? Excellent. Okay, so our feasibility study has identified three different crossing structures. Um, why three, why not just one, you might ask. Well, you don't want animals to have to walk for 10 miles before they can find a place to cross. Otherwise, they're just gonna beeline it across the road and they probably won't be very successful. But if you give them multiple options, um, different types of structures and different areas that they can cross, you're, you're ensuring a lot more success of the entire system. So we have identified three places on the westbound lanes of I-70 where wildlife crossing structures could work really well. Two of those are underpasses and one is this glorious hourglass overpass that I'm really excited to share with you guys. When you talk about wildlife crossing structures, we always want to include fencing. It's actually wildlife exclusion fencing, but fencing is always part of the project. Without fencing to guide animals to those crossing structures, you're not going to have high levels of success. Um, with the crossing structures, you're just basically, they'll walk along the fence until they hit a spot to cross and then head over. So that, that ensures that these are much more successful. So that's a big piece of um, the design as well. It's not just the structures, it's figuring out where you're going to tie in the fencing. How do you tie it in? Um, and fencing is a, it's a big cost to, to have um, miles and miles of interstate fenced. In this area in particular, we're talking about two different, we, we're not just fencing the westbound lanes where the structures would be. We're also going to be fencing where the existing structures, those span bridges are on the eastbound lanes. We've got to fence those as well to create an entire system that animals can move back and forth between without having to worry about and are getting hit by cars. So the first structure we're looking at is the one closest to uh, Copper and Town of Frisco. So the easternmost, and this is a buried bridge. So mile marker 193 and a half or so, just past Copper Mountain. Um, this Barry Bridge is pretty unique. They don't, they don't build a lot of these according to CDOT. So CDOT was the, they reviewed and, and had a lot of input on this feasibility study. And they really like the idea of this Barry Bridge. What's really cool about it is that it's insulated. So it prevents icing, which is a big concern of CDOTs. So you've got four feet of fill on top of this structure to, to insulate it from 
the air and uh, keep it from icing over. It's a pretty large bridge as well. So we're talking about 85 feet across the width of it. Yep, and it'll serve good purpose for elk. Let's see, and 15 feet high, which accommodates elk, deer, maybe even some moose in this area. Um, so pretty, pretty large, large bridge in this area. So 15 feet high, 85 feet across. That is wrong. Here we go. We had a question. Here. It's relevant. Yes. Sure. Wondering if snow loads impact the fencing and yes. responsible for the fencing maintenance. That is a question that we kick around on a pretty regular basis. CDOT doesn't really want to be responsible for it, but it makes the most sense for CDOT to be responsible for, since they're taking care of the plowing anyhow, um, the fencing would also be maintained. So well, those are one of those hidden costs that you don't think about from the very beginning, uh, not just building the fencing, but also maintaining the fence. So inevitably there'll be repairs that need to be done to the fencing every single year. Um, snow loading can be an issue in some areas, most of the fencing that we're looking at is set back far enough to where we're dealing with like natural snow building up on it um, versus um, plows pushing snow up against the fence. One of the concerns with snow loading uh, could be, well, is it gonna be high enough for animals to just jump over the fence? Potentially, however, this area, like we had uh, said before, is really more targeted for summertime use. So we're not gonna see nearly as much movement in this area in the winter time when we've got those big snow loads as we will in the summertime. So it really makes that um, not, not as much of a concern as it would be if this were winter range for elk and deer. Hopefully that helps the answer. Certainly. Cool. So here's our underpass, 85 feet wide, um, 45 feet across, so you want to make sure it's open enough and it's not too long if it's this giant dark tunnel, animals aren't going to use it. So uh, it's got to be visibly appealing, visually appealing to elk and deer that are going to use this structure. Um, moose will go through anything. They don't seem to care about much. And again, that four feet of fill to keep it insulated. Here's some really cool stuff that this story map does. These are the before and afters. The actual drone footage of Vail Pass. So we're going to scoot this over. So this is what it looks like now. Visualize this cool underpass going in on Vail Pass as soon as we have money. Pretty neat. So oh, hang on. Okay, so the second structure we're looking at is a little bit up the road, um, about a half mile further up the road towards Vail Pass we're recommending an arch underpass. These are more of your typical style uh, wildlife underpasses that you might see. This, these are what is used, has been used on um, Highway 9 as well. Um, the idea behind using a couple of different structures is that we wanna see what, we wanna investigate all of our options. It could turn out down the road that as we continue designing, we say, nope, we're only gonna go with the underpass or the uh, Berry Bridge, or we're only gonna do the arch underpass if it turns out that there's fatal flaws with either of these. We've at least looked at these and we know that in this feasibility study, we, these are interchangeable. We could do either or in either location. Um, they each have their unique benefits though. Okay, so let's take a look at this arch underpass. So this is a precast concrete structure that just gets plopped into place and traffic gets routed around it while the construction is being done to it. So this one's a little bit smaller than our, our bridge. It's not going to be as wide underneath and it's not quite as tall, but it's still going to accommodate most animals. It's about a foot and a half shorter than the um, buried bridge, but this will still facilitate great movement for our resident lynx that we have in this area, for coyotes, for any of those small mammals, um, and even elk and deer. That's another shot of it from different angle. So like I said, a little bit shorter, 13 and a half feet high versus that 15 feet of the uh, Berry Bridge. Same length across the interstate. 
this one's also insulated. So we still got that fill on top that's gonna keep it from icing. Again, addressing that concern from CDOT for um, icy spots on the road. In our before and after, my favorite part. So starting with our current situation out there and adding in, you can see the wildlife fencing coming into play there and then our arch underpass, super cool. And then the, um, the Mac Daddy of all of the structures, my favorite, our favorite, the hourglass overpass. This is gonna be a beautiful site when it's constructed. So this one occurs a little bit further up the road at mile marker 192.3. It's um, pretty close to across from an existing span bridge in the Stafford and Guller Creek area. Um, So that's, that's your visual. That is from the median side of I-70 and looking at the structure towards the, the north side of the interstate there. A little visual for you. So this is gonna have, um, we've looked at those traditional angled walls for overpasses and opted for this hourglass for a couple of different reasons. It might be slightly more expensive. However, and, and really it is truly like slightly, not that much more expensive, but it's gonna have this better like approach. If you're an animal approaching it, it's got a much wider um, entrance. So it's, it's a gentler slope and a wider entrance versus just a straightforward overpass, making it a lot more appealing for a lot of animals. The other thing that's kind of cool, so it's it's pretty wide, as wide as normal structures until you get to the very center of the hourglass here and it, it constricts to about 85 feet across at its narrowest point, but then it immediately opens up again. So you talk about you wanting things to be as wide as possible. The approaches are very wide, which is really the most important part is to make it useful to animals. If they're not, if, if it's not approachable, then they're not gonna use it at all. Once they're up there, they're gonna go across even if it's only 80 feet, 85 feet wide versus 100 feet wide. So that's the view if you were an elk or deer heading up the, the overpass, plenty wide in that area. So the engineers did lots of calculations and came up with the appropriate width so again, you see that it's 100 feet wide, narrows down to 85 and quickly gets back to 100 feet and then and even more as they're heading down the other side of the overpass. Narrowing it in the middle also brings down the cost a little bit. And we think that the hourglass is just a lot more aesthetically pleasing to the landscape than um, those hard angles are. So for our motorists traveling this direction, it'll be a joy to look at. You've got a nice gentle slope leading up to it. Oh, again, a lot more appealing for most animals, a good visibility for elk and deer heading across. Um, all of our structures are wide enough to accommodate a potential third lane should CDOT decide that that is something they're gonna do in the future. Um, right now, there are no current plans for that, but we went ahead and just guessed that that might be an issue in the future. So built that into the design as well. So all of our structures consider a third lane plus room for snow loading as well. So to go back to that snow loading um, and snow storage question that has been addressed. This is my favorite. Okay, current conditions out there. You've got a you know, high side of the road on the right and then it drops down to a lower section. So here's our wildlife fencing and our amazing hourglass overpass. It's gonna look beautiful. Can't wait. There's a lot of special considerations. So there's lots of things that, that um, get addressed in this, um, in this study that you can go into detail on, on your own on that one. Snow storage, shading, wetlands, all of those little things. No fatal flaws at this point, all stuff that will continue to be addressed as we go down the road and continue designing this. The next phase of this is gonna be um, the NEPA design. So the environmental review 
and, and scoping to the public. Uh, as soon as the funds are available for that, we'll start into the next phase. And then once it's, it has been designed and gone through environmental review, it'll be ready for to be put out for bid for construction. So um, as you can imagine, a lot more funds that need to be raised for this. And um, that's what we're working on. That's really, you know, the, the big issue, like I talked about before, is, is budget and funding. And uh, we have to get really creative when it comes to how this is going to look. So lots more detail there. I'm not going to go into a ton of it. I'm going to let you guys dive into this on your own. I don't want to go over 5 o'clock. I want to be sensitive to folks' schedule here. There's a lot more information to share. There's some great uh, monitoring that's occurred. Over the past five years on Vail Pass, we have some gorgeous pictures of the animals that we found in this area. Um, so at this point, I would like to open it up to questions or final thoughts from the folks that have joined us here. I'm gonna scroll through these cute pictures too while I'm um, talking and answering questions. Awesome. Great job, Ashley. That is uh, an awesome presentation and this is easily, the webinar that we've done with the most interaction through Zoom questions, Facebook questions. So people are interested in this topic and it's an important one in our county and uh, you're doing a great job to spearhead this. Um, so we had a question from Facebook here. It says, I live in Eastvale. I can see bears, foxes, deers, and so on crossing the Highway 6 in front of my house. And we have the Highway 6 and the I-70 that make a big barrier with the Eagle River in the middle. This mm -hmm. needs some kind of structure to connect wildlife. Thanks for the info. More of a comment than a question, but. Yeah, but I'd love to address that comment because um, you're in luck. There is a similar process that occurred in Eagle County called Eagle County Safe Passages. And your county, actually Adam Palmer, um, who recently was killed in an avalanche, he spearheaded the effort in Eagle County to get this um, connectivity plan created for Eagle County and it's been incorporated into the county planning documents as well. Um, so you have a group there in Summit County or excuse me in Eagle County that is working on this and that has identified just like we have these areas of um, high need for connectivity where there are wildlife vehicle collisions taking into consideration all of those special factors that you have there with the you know, um, the river, the Highway 6, you've got multiple roads to go across. Um, it's a little bit more complex in Eagle County, honestly, but I would encourage you to reach out to the county to um, get a hold of that plan. I know that they have that, it's accessible to the public, but um, yeah, those have actually been identified. So you've got a group of folks working towards that. I encourage you to get involved. Um, yeah, people just saying thanks for sourcing the info. Thanks so much. Uh, someone said the new logo truck looks fantastic. <laughs> Can't imagine a more worthwhile project to help protect our local wildlife and motorists. Um, another question here uh, says, do you have or expect use from links? And also says, thank you. Great job. Um, we do actually. So uh, we have collared links in that area about 10 years ago. Um, we've tracked them pretty well. We know that they typically are residing on the south side of the interstate between tucked in between Copper Mountain and Vail Pass Recreation Area. They cross the highway 1.6 times per week. But what's interesting is they have modified their behavior. Lynx are actually active um, throughout the day and night. They're not necessarily just nocturnal animals, but they have uh, modified their behavior to only cross the highway at night when traffic volumes are the lowest. And they're not crossing probably nearly as much as they would had, if they had a crossing structure. So yes, we would anticipate links to probably use those underpasses, maybe not so much the overpass. They're a little more secretive. They like a little more cover, um, but the underpasses are actually right there in front of the, the areas that they are already utilizing. And we would anticipate that. We'll be doing monitoring both pre and post construction um, on many of our species in this area and um, through wildlife camera monitoring to see which animals are using it and, and how long it takes them to, to adjust. Um, I've got a question for you. Sure. Can, uh, how can people get more involved with Summit County Safe Passages? What is a good way for, for them to help you guys out? 
Well, let's see. I think I even have a slide on that. It's probably down here in the, uh, you can donate. That always helps. Um, money goes a really long way. And uh, the other thing that we can do this summer, if you're interested in, in getting involved in some citizen science, this past year, we couldn't do it, but this, this coming year, Rocky Mountain Wild and Denver Zoo partnered together as part of the Colorado Corridors Project. And they've been, like I said, monitoring wildlife in this section. Um, and we're expanding that monitoring effort to include not just the overpass location, but also the two underpass locations. So they're looking for volunteers to get involved that can head out in the field and help them set up wildlife cameras and then go back out with them and change locations and take cameras down throughout the summer. The other thing that you'll wanna look for towards the end of the summer when those cameras are collected is a way to passively, or excuse me, it's not passive, it is active, but from, your, from the luxury of your couch and your home computer, you can um, help them identify animals that have come up in all of those cameras. So every single photo that, that hits uh, those cameras has to be identified correctly 30 times before you can say, yes, that's an elk, or yes, that's a deer, or yes, that's a lynx, or whatever it may be. And that happens on a website called Zooniverse, where the project is uploaded. So it's a really fun way. It's actually pretty addictive when you start flipping through and identifying animals, and you just get to look at uh, wildlife cameras um, all afternoon, or however long you would spend on it. So there, there are several ways that you can get involved. I would really encourage anyone who wants to get involved, head to our website, summitcountysafepassages.org. Um, on the Vail Pass uh, page, there are several links that you can check out about how you can get involved. We're always looking for, for new folks. Or if you want to be part of our crew, and if you've got great grant writing experience or fundraising experience, you want to offer those skills to us, we'll take them. We're in need. Sweet. and. Uh... We'll see what happens. We haven't kind of we haven't really put together our summer program yet, but usually about once a summer, um, we'll have a public project open, and we partner. This is a little bit different, but we partner with Ashley on it um, and do a barbed wire removal project. So this is old property boundaries that people are willing to remove um, from their properties, and we come in and remove the wild or the barbed wire fencing, and this allows the wildlife to roam freely. We did a couple projects last year up near Acorn Creek. Um, so it's a great way to give back. Um, so look out for that on the FDRD calendar as well. Mm -hmm. It's a good way to kind of contribute to this wildlife habitat reclamation. Um, but I think that was all the questions we had. Yeah. Um, I want to give a huge, huge thank you to Ashley. That's a great presentation. Um, and they're doing such good stuff, as I said. And we're really lucky to uh, have Ashley come on here and do this webinar for us. And really lucky to have her in the county pushing forward this initiative. So thank you, Ashley. Yeah, uh, thank you, Kim. I'm always happy to come on and, um, and push this initiative. It's just really fun to talk about. It's something I'm really passionate about and it's excited to, exciting to share it with people and get them, get them excited too. So tell your friends, check out our Facebook page, just start talking about it. I think more people just need to know that this is actually happening in our backyard and the more support we get from our community, the, uh, the faster these structures will get construct will get built. So thank you guys very much. Awesome. So and also thanks to all you guys for tuning in. As I stated earlier, this is easily the most interaction we've had with the guests on the webinar. So it's it's really cool to have you guys on here. And we can't be together in these large groups right now with COVID going on. But there's at least a small sense of community going on with these webinars. And I'm really happy that we're able to run them. Um, we've got a couple more coming up this month. Next Thursday, one week from today, we have Colonel Tom Dews presenting on the 10th Mountain Division. Uh, another great presentation. He's a co-author of a book about the 10th Mountain Division. Who, it's a World War II ski troops that trained out of Camp Hale, kind of on the backside of Vail Pass in the same zone we're talking about now. Um, so that's next Thursday at four o'clock. And then two weeks out from now, I believe on, give me one sec, on Thursday, the 25th of March at uh, 4 p.m., we have local mining historian Rick Haig and also an FDRD board member coming on to present about um, the gold rush and how that kind of took over Colorado in the late 1800s. So We've got a couple good ones lined up here in the next few weeks and we hope to see some more people tuned in and more information about that on our website. 
thanks everyone. We'll, uh, we'll end here. Um, take care and uh, we'll, we'll see you soon. Thank you.